Hey guys, welcome back to SimTech channel. In this tutorial, we're going to discuss the rating of the circuit breaker in connection to a fault current calculations. Now, when determining what is the rating of the circuit breaker, you have to ensure that... Whoa, what just happened? Uh, I think there is a power outage. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to... Okay, so how about... How to build an electronic main sensing. Basically, a device that can detect a power outage and automatically launch in a backup system. Obviously, this is similar to what we call a switch over circuit or a change over circuit. Now, let's go ahead and find out what we can do with that. So I'm going to stop this tutorial and move on to do that. Okay, so here we are to design our main sensing circuit. So we are connected straight from our mains, okay? So we got the live and we have a neutral. Now remember this is AC, so it could be either 120 volt or 230 volt depending on where you are. So we got live and neutral. Now we can include a fuse here for safety, safety okay? So we include a fuse for safety, that is very important. And What's the next thing to connect? We're going to connect our capacitor. I forgot to mention that there are several circuits that you can design for main sensing circuit. Most of them are used with inverters, they call changeover switches, uh, where it can automatically detect when there is a power outage and then it switch over to the backup system. Now, this one here, we're going to be using the simplest uh, voltage regulator from the mains which is a capacitor dropper circuit so we're going to include our capacitor here now the capacitor dropper circuit is basically we're using the capacitive reactance xc okay to limit the current without wasting power in the form of heat okay otherwise we'll just put a resistor to limit the AC current here but they're going to be a lot of heat so which means in this case here we use XC which is the impedance of the capacitor the capacitive reactance and that's going to limit our current now remember this capacitor here need to be a 400 volt capacitor okay now the value of the capacitor will determine how much current will go into our load circuit that we want to have on this side okay now Remember also, because this capacitor is connected to your live and neutral, it's going to be fully charged either on 120 or 230. So that means if it's not discharged, you disconnect AC, there's still going to be a 120 or 230 volt here. Now to avoid someone getting shocked, you connect two resistors here just to enable it to discharge the capacitor. Now the value could be 500k each. Make sure that it's big resistor so that it discharge it faster. Okay, so we've got our circuit like that. Okay, now to complete our circuit on the other end of the capacitor dropper connection here, we put a bridge rectifier. Okay, I'm just going to represent a bridge rectifier with a diode symbol. We know that it's a full full wave bridge rectifier. Okay, with four diodes connected to rectify the AC signal. So which means here we've got a plus and we've got a minus. Okay. So, what's happening here? We fully rectify our AC and the current going through this bridge here is limited by the capacitive reactance of this big capacitor here. Okay, now let's say we put a 220 nanofarad capacitor here. We know that we're going to be limited by the current here. We're going to calculate that later. Okay, so what's happening here now? We can then configure from the output here. So let's say we want to smooth the DC voltage that's coming here because we know that it is a ripple DC voltage that comes out of here full wave so the capacitor will just smooth on it and reduce the ripple and we go the next thing is we connect the Zener diode okay now I'm going to put a 5 volt Zener diode here because the circuit that I want to power here is going to be a 5 volt circuit what's the next thing I'm going to connect I will connect a resistor here. I connect a 1K resistor here. 
Now, many of you might be asking why is there no resistor here to limit the current going into the zener diode? Because basically there could be an inrush current here once you connect AC because the capacitor will try to pull as much current on the first time constant and all of that current will come through here. Okay? Also based on this capacitor here, the zener diode might break if it's not rated higher. But for for design's sake, we can put a resistor, but I'm leaving it out here. So the only current limiting for this one here is for the XXC that is limiting. The, the capacitive reactance is limiting the current through the zener here. Otherwise, there is no protection for the inrush current. We can include a resistor here, okay? That can also limit the, the inrush current. Okay, now the next thing here is to connect our isolator, okay? An optocoupler. I forgot to mention that this circuit is actually an isolated. An isolated man's sensing circuit. So we're going to connect an opto isolator here. And once again, I'm just going to build it as a block. And we know that an opto isolator is a device that got a, a diode or an LED inside of it that is connected like this. Okay, a light emitting diode. Okay, so this one here is a light emitting diode. And when there is conductivity, this, this diode illuminate inside, it's bias the transistor here. Okay, there is a transistor connected there. Okay, it's an NPN transistor that's connected this way. Okay, so this is a, the collector and this is the emitter. Now, this 1K resistor is precisely for this LED inside the opto isolator. This could be any opto isolator that you can find. Now, I'm using a KB817, which is a very popular one. Okay. Now, what am I going to do here? On this side here, I'm going to connect a relay. I'm going to connect a relay switching circuit so that now I know that this transistor is only going to conduct when there is a presence of mains here. When there is a presence of mains here, okay, there will be a 5 volt here and the 5 volt is going to set up a current, okay, that's going to bias this LED, drive this LED and in turn it's going to switch on this transistor inside the opto isolator. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to then include another transistor into the circuit that's going to switch our relay coil so let's go ahead and plug in a transistor here so we've got another npn transistor that's going to be connected like this okay and on this side here we're going to have a relay so this is our relay coil okay that's a relay coil now the relay here is going to be switching so we're going to have two pole relay, a normally closed and a normally connected. Okay. So now let's say here we got our input pole and then we've got two poles here. So this is the side the relay is on a normally closed. In our case here, we are connecting a 12 volt supply here plus 12 volt. So let's say it's coming from the battery. So we've got a 12 volt battery there. Okay. So what will happen here is from the relay here, we need to have an output that is coming straight from the 12 volt and is going into our lamp. Now, let's say we've got a lamp here. I'm just going to put a symbol of a lamp like that. And this is going to, to ground. Okay. And this ground here is basically the same ground as this one on the transistor. Now you can see that this circuit is completely isolated from our mains reference here. Because this one now is referenced from our 12 volt battery. Okay. Now we. So this is a plus And this is a minus. From our 12 volt battery. Okay. Now the same 12 volt is connected. And that's the one that is powering the relay. And also the collector of this transistor here. Inside the opto isolator okay the opto coupler so what will happen when there is mains okay mains is present the leds is on 
the transistor here is biased so we've got conductivity so current will flow like this okay and that in turn will induce some current here and then we put a resistor here to the base of this transistor so we're going to bias this transistor here so we can put i don't know a 470 ohm resistor it doesn't matter 470 ohm resistor we can calculate how much current we set for for this transistor here that will basically mean the circuit is completed when this transistor is biased okay we're going to have a flow here and what will happen is the relay here the relay coil will be energized the relay coil will be energized and that will cause this pole here to switch over to this side cutting power from this one okay so if there is no ac basically this transistor is off and this transistor is also off the relay is not energized and this lamp is going to stay on okay because it is connected on a normally closed path of the 12 volt battery and we just need to include here a diode to protect here because after the, the, the relay have been energized there's going to be a back emf here now if we don't want to be changing transistor all the time we better include the diode here to block the back emf so this is basically the circuit for an isolated man's sensing circuit in a simple of the form so what will happen i've already explained it i will go one more time in the presence of ac this capacitor the cap dropper will charge and will release some current through the bridge rectifier and that current will also charge this smoothing capacitor here and we're going to have our 5 volt regulated here and that in turn is going to induce current to bias this led inside the opto coupler and that in turn will bias this base here and this transistor will turn on and there will be some current that will flow from the battery independent of the mains and that current will then bias this transistor here and what will happen when this transistor is on there will be some current that's going to flow from the coil down this way and when the coil is energized this switch will flip this side and that will cut power from here so which mean if there is ac they will this one is going to be off okay if there is mains this one is off when mains goes away this one come back on so automatically main sensing so what would mean is you need to have a parallel circuit so you've got your main connected circuit and then you've got your backup connected circuit so both circuit cannot be connected on the same mains so the two lamps must be disconnected so you've got one lamp here okay one lamp here running on the main and one lamp here running on your backup that way when your mains runs out okay when the power there's power outage you've already got a backup that will come on on this side so this is how the circuit work now <clears throat> we need to do another calculation and that will be how to calculate this current that's going on here i've already said in the beginning that this current is limited by your xc which is your capacitive reactance now it's very simple to calculate that now if you have been studying engineering electrical or electronics we know that xc okay is given by that's a capacitive reactance okay the impedance of the capacitor is given by 1 over 2 pi okay fc okay so f is a frequency of your mains and c is your capacitor now in this case we're just going to replace here quickly so that we can get our xc so we got our one okay 2 pi our f here i'm going to take a case of 50 hertz okay for those using a 230 for those on a 120 that will be 60 hertz so i'm going to say we've got a 50 here and then we choose a capacitor of 220 nanofarad that is 10 to the power minus 9 like that now let's go ahead and calculate that now i'm not sure if you can see there my calculator gave me an answer of 14,468 ohm so that basically will mean it's 14.4 okay kilo ohm so that is the value of my capacitive reactance so what it means is what will be the value of my current 
So the value of the current here will be just ohm law. Okay, so which mean I RMS, okay, I RMS here will be V RMS divided by XC, okay, then V RMS in a case of 230 here, that will be 230 divided by the 14K, 14.4, forgive my pain here is misbehaving, okay, so that will be 230 divided by 14 okay and i'm getting about 0, 0, something something there so that will mean 15.9 milliamps okay now i you see i just rounded here because obviously you're going to find the closest resistor value you won't find a 14k you could find a 13k or you could find a 15k Either way, your current range is going to be from 12 milliamps up to 20 milliamps using the 220 nanofarad capacitor. So that will be the amount of current that's going to go through this Zener diode. So the Zener diode is safe, but not the inrush current when you first connect it. That's why we put a resistor here to limit the inrush current. Okay? All right. Now... This is basically the circuit. Hey guys, thanks for tuning into Simtech channel. This is part two of the previous tutorial on how to design a man's sensing device. Basically a device that can sense the presence of your man's power and take appropriate action when the man's power is no longer present. And that would mean to turn on your backup lamp in case of a power outage. I got the idea to design this device because of a couple of time I had to go through a power outage when I was trying to record a tutorial. So now you need some backup plans to avoid a blackout in case of a power outage. Okay, so what I've done now here is I've imported the schematic or I've redrawn the schematic using Altium Designer which is a CAD schematic PCB design software. As you can see, the schematic have now been drawn properly in Altium Designer. Now, let me take you through it one more time. And so that we can all be on board of what's happening in the schematic here. If you haven't watched the part one tutorial, I suggest you watch part one tutorial so that you understand how we got to this schematic. But it's a very simple schematic. So to begin with, we've got a man's input here. So that basically your life and your neutral input and your live wire is going into a fuse because this whole circuit will be working on a low amperage so you don't want a short circuit to be created somewhere and more than one amp of a circuit going through and burning everything so actually this fuse could be reduced to like a 500 milliamp fuse or even a 200 milliamp fuse for that matter okay then you have this R1, a 33 ohm resistor. Now this resistor was initially not there on the previous tutorial. Now we decided to include it because it's going to be serving as a, a limiting for the inrush current for this D3 Zener diode. Because this capacitor here, as long as, as soon as the AC mains is connected, C1 will try to charge and it will try to pull as much current as possible because it will be flat at that time. And that current will be creating an inrush current that might be damaging to the Zener diode. So you put the 33 ohm resistor here to try to limit that current to uh, an acceptable value. Then we have this MOV here, Varista, which is a 43 volt. So in case of a surge voltage, the voltage will be clamped down to 43 volt. That is also to protect the entire circuit, which is based on a 5 volt regulator here. Then we have our cap dropper, uh, 220 nano farad capacitor, which I've already explained the cap dropper. Okay. And then we've got the two resistor R2 and 3, which will be for the discharging of the capacitor when the mains is disconnected. So remember, this capacitor will be fully charged. To the level of 230 volt or 120 so when you disconnect your mains if 
the capacitor haven't been discharged through the circuit here there will be some residual voltage left there so you want it to be discharged via arc 2 and 3 so that you avoid shocking someone with it okay so we're done on that part then we come on the input of the bridge rectifier so it's a full wave bridge rectifier with the part number md6 now this bridge rectifier will give us a ripple output okay of a full wave then we're smoothing it with a capacitor of 222 nano uh, microfarad okay now this capacitor can be a 25 volt or a 50 volt capacitor there is no problem because this voltage is already either way clamped at 5 volt with the 5 volt zena diode then we have this resistor r4 r4 is a limiting resistor for the optocoupler led okay because we need to bias this led appropriately so that in turn when the led is turned on we can then bias the base of this uh, transistor here all is happening inside the optocoupler part number kb817 okay then after that so this is all happening if there is a man's presence that's what's going to happen you're going to have a 5 volt here and then the 5 volt is going to induce a current here onto this led and that's going to uh, base bias this big bjt and that will then turn on the q2 okay when q2 turns on automatically this relay here will switch from this pole here because it's now set up at normally closed okay when q2 is on the relay coil will be energized and it will pull this pole on this normally open and there will be no more power going through like this from the 12 volt all the way to our backup lamp so this is our 12 volt battery connection that is supplying this section of the circuit okay not this section this section here is coming from the bridge only the output of the opto isolator is being supplied from the battery side okay now r6 okay r6 here is the pull down for the base that is to ensure that the transistor is always shut down when the mains is also off okay because there is always something we call a miller capacitance between your base and your collector so when your transistor seemingly is off there is always some leakage current that will be flowing from the collector and that can cause noises into your system so if you pull it down then you are creating the path for that small current to go down to the ground so this is why you have that pull down r6 so this is basically how the circuit work and d2 we already say is your back emf protection when the relay coil latch okay so that is it so now we're going to now move into uh, designing the pcb layout for the circuit so what you do is after you've drawn all your component you come on design if any of any of you is familiar with altium designer this is what you do so you do pcb document update and then it is supposed to take all your pcb uh, your schematic part and then import it into your pcb so when i click on the main sensing pcb then i've got all the component are already here so what is happening here is all these components they are now awaiting to be placed into the pcb i've already drawn the pcb size okay now if i go to 3d viewing you can see i've got all my component ready to be placed into the pcb okay so now i'm going to start placing them block by block why block by block because that will uh, facilitate the routing afterward because you don't want to place like j1 together with j3 because you can see they do not have any uh, link whatsoever in the routing so which means j1 here must be placed together with f1 r1 because they are grouped together so that's what group uh, component placement means so let's find j1 f1 r1 and place them where is j1 there is j1 so i'm going to pull j1 and i'm going to place it right here okay so we've got j1 place the next thing to do we're going to find a fuse where is a fuse this is the mov fuse fuse f1 fuse there it is f1 fuse so we're placing the f1 fuse here because remember the power 
is going to go through our connector and through the fuse before it, it goes into the cap dropper uh, circuitry here. Okay, so now the next thing is to place our R1. Okay, so we place R1. There is R1. So this is the, uh, the in rush current limiting resistor. Then we can then place this capacitor here. As you can see, this capacitor here is also connecting with R1. They've got like uh, something going on like that. Okay, then we can then place the two resistor, the two cap dropper resistor, that is R2 and R3, okay, for the discharge. So I grab R2 and I grab R3. We can place it like that. Now let's just play with space here. We can place R2 there and R3 like that. The way we do that is because this one here is a one net. So we just want that one net to be connected. And this point here is just the holes for the mounting. All of these guys here are holes for mounting. Okay. Then the next thing here is to place the RV1. That is the MOV. RV1, MOV. We, we just grab him again. And then we place him there. Okay, so RV1 is placed. The cap dropper resistors are placed. Everything is placed. Okay, just neatly like that. Then we can then move on. From there, we can get our bridge and then get the capacitor and so forth. So let's first get the bridge. We can get the bridge also. Just notice how I'm placing everything accordingly so that they can be rooted properly also. Because the neutral is coming to here and then the live one because that is now on the output of this cap dropper here and that's going into there on that side. So now I can place now my capacitor C2 and C2 can be placed like that. Now it's not interfering because D1 here is placed on the bottom side and C2 is placed on the top side. We can view it with the 3D as you can see like that there it is so this is our d1 the bridge rectifier and then the capacitor is right on top of it so this is how it shows on the layout here okay now the next thing to place here is we can place a zener diode d3 and r4 let's get a zener diode d3 okay there is d3 Notice how I'm placing the 5 volt point. Okay, that is your cathode of your Zena. We're placing it right next to the capacitor positive side there. And then we've got the ground. Now remember this ground here, we can then just pass it like that. So always maintain the clearances. So this is how you do routing. Maintain clearances with uh, nets that got high potential versus nets that got low potential. For instance, this ground here is a low potential compared to the live wire here. So you must make sure there is a, a good gap between them. So if I take a measurement quickly here, you can see I've got 4 millimeter from that uh, live potential to the ground level, which is quite huge because normally the requirement is somewhere around 2 millimeter. So I'm double that, so I'm safe. Okay, so now we can place what? The resistor here and the optocoupler U2. Let's first grab the optocoupler. Okay, uh, you can see that everything is aligning perfectly here. So we place the optocoupler there. That's the, the input of the optocoupler. Then we've got the resistor also need to be connected here. That is R4. Let's grab R4. There is R4. R4 right there. Okay, now you can see that there is no more net that is crossing from this side here this section of the circuit there is nothing crossing this section of the circuit going into that side so this is why this is isolated it's an isolated mains voltage detector so we can then place this yellow mark here because this yellow mark here means 
there is no electrical connection between these two points nothing between these two sides and those sides so we can actually even cut the board here we'll just leave a thin connection there uh the circuit will still going to work because they work independently from one another although they require a bias from this side okay now what's the next thing to do we are now on this side here so this is where we need our transistor q2 and the relay to be placed so let's first bring the relay in okay now you can see the connection of the relay of the 12 volt is going into the collector of the optocoupler so we can just place it like that it should be fine okay let's just look at it how it look like okay the optocoupler is placed at the bottom there it is so we basically just have the optocoupler in between the relays placed from the bottom okay then okay let's maybe just extend our pcb because this relay here is standing quite very 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 close to the edges of the pcb so if we can just click on the pcb outline then we can just pull the pcb outline slightly like that and then what you do is you go on pcb outline there then shift s then you select the whole pcb outline then you hit the shortcut key dsd and then your pcb is now extended so now we've got some room to play here the relay is now sitting fully inside the pcb okay so now the next thing to do here is to bring the rest of the component so that would mainly be let first bring the transistor here because it's also connected on the side okay then we have that connection done then we can bring in the diode that is the free wheel diode or the back emf diode d2 d2 we bring in d2 like that is that connection perfect yes let's put him a little bit up there and then we have this connection is going to where is going to r5 okay there is r5 like that okay r5 now r5 is also connected to r6 i believe yes there is a point where there to the base of that q2 where is the base of q2 there is a base of q2 so that is one net so which means we can connect r6 in a way that can make sense so if we put r6 like that then what should happen here is this net is the same now let's rather now let's place it this way okay no not not on top because they must not be on top they should be this way if we look at the 3d view let's just go there at the bottom there you can see there is r5 and there is r6 so they should not be on top of each other so this one can actually just come a bit close there on the outline of the component okay so now the next component to place here is actually just a connector so j3 which is the the output yes that's a backup lamp output so that is when when the relay when there is no mains there is a 12 volt going on to j3 so our lamp will be on when there is no no mains so this is where we put our j3 right there okay okay let's just put him a little bit further there cool then we can take j2 which is the input of the battery okay and j2 can just be placed here like that that's j2 now we've got the dummy symbol of the battery here so that is but the one that's referenced on the schematic as but now this one can may or may not be there it does not matter because the battery connection is already coming into j2 here but uh, just for the purpose of illustration we can put it here okay it's gonna be exactly the same connections so if we look at it there it is let's just flip this board like that okay so there it is so this is j2 okay all right so this is j2 that's the input of the battery and that's the output to the backup lamp and this is our mains input there is our fuse that's a big capacitor the cap dropper 
and that's our capacitor that is in the diode and this one here is the metal oxide varista for the protection of the whole circuit okay so there we have everything is set and done here now guess what's the next thing to do here is basically to complete the routing so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to hide certain things here so that i can do the routing easily so i'm gonna hide the top overlay okay and i'm gonna also hide the bottom overlay that way i only have the circuit clear so that i can see where my routing is going now at this point here you can either do auto routing so that basically means you just hit auto routing and the thing is just going to connect the net without you guiding the net but if you want your net to go exactly your routing to go how you want them so you're going to do a manual routing so that's what i'm going to do i will select on the bottom layer because that's where the components are mostly placed the 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 this smt component so i will root from the bottom layer there then i connect the live wire into this connector then i take this side here now this is one net as you can see let's maybe just move this one a little bit there okay that's one net and then we've got a connection like that and this connection now let's just increase that thickness make it uh, 0 0.7 okay the thickness of the track then we've got these connections to the mov like that and then you have this connection also to the mov make it also 0 0.7 millimeter then you've got a live wire it can either decide to go there or it can go there so you can choose which one is the better routing so i prefer to go there then maybe let's just move this resistor there so that we can have a, a good uh, connection like that then the neutral wire is going into this point from the bridge then you've got now the output of the bridge so you have this ground connection like that and then you've got the 5 volt okay now this ground here actually should also be just be increased in size let's make it also 0 0.7 it doesn't matter really much just because it's a ground wire that is a reference bringing all the return current so let's just make it slightly bigger okay then we need to draw from this point here now i would like to now just go underneath here okay like that now notice how i went underneath the bridge rectifier but i'm staying clear from the neutral and live wire there because i don't want to be too close there risking a short circuit that would blow the whole thing off so i've got like 2.6 millimeter which is big enough of a clearance so i leave that like that then i come to this point here complete this connection let's just increase this thickness also okay even this this track thickness must also be increased but we can do it later now let's connect the 5 volt routing Five volt routing. Five volt routing is done, and then we come to this side. Okay. Now we've completed all our connections from that mains capacitor dropper side. Now we're coming to the low voltage side here. Okay. Then we join also the collector here and that connection is the same okay we've got uh, our free wheel diode the back emf protection diode that's connecting like that okay so now to complete our routing we just need to finish up on this side here completing the routing okay that's net and then the 12 volt net okay then we have this net also going that way okay what more we need to connect okay the input of the battery that one 
and his net you can see how easy it is to do your routing once once everything is done once you get your component placement perfectly the rest become really just uh, a, a game you are playing here because the components have been placed perfectly so now your routing is just going to be much easier okay all right now let's just bring this somewhere there in the middle because we don't want to be creating potential for short okay so we've got this second ground here that need to be routed okay so this point can travel like that now this this is a bit too thick let's reduce the thickness okay tab and then let's just make it 0.5 there because it's going underneath that uh, 1206 resistor like that so I can move these resistors slightly like that so that that point can just be there okay now we only have a few connection left that is these two point here that need to be connected and this point that's going all the way into our transistor base there okay that point now you've got this connection still need to be connected okay so what is happening here this point this point need to go there so we need to make a way here it's either we take this guy let's take this guy pass him here okay if we take that guy pass him there then this guy here make him six and then he can pass there like that now what will happen here is we realize that this track here is maybe a little bit too tight okay it may be a little bit too tight here so which means we can extend the pcb just slightly just slightly because we don't want to be routing things on the board's edge that is really oops oops just back 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 space and then you are back into the normal to the safe zone okay something like that okay then you have this connection also that need to go from this point here into this point there and that's it now let's just uh, uh, readjust the PCB size okay now notice the, there is room for improvement there is some spacing I can make this PCB much smaller if I want to but uh, because it's just a prototype we are design testing here so we can go for what we have here right now if we want to make it much smaller obviously you can change some component and check the component rating make them very small and what what reduce the size of the component but as you can see this is a complete pcb this is a complete pcb for this man's sensing device okay so now the only thing left now to do here is to uh, get the gerbers generate the gerbers for this pcb do all the final details that you need to do all the um, the designators the um, yeah all your designators and top overlays and everything uh, your naming of your component and then you can generate the gerbers file and uh, send it to glc then they can design you uh, generate you or manufacture you a pcb for your project okay but then what i'm going to do is i'm not going to do a glc uh, for now i'm going to etch this pcb i'm going to do pcb etching so that will be a very quick prototype we're going to etch it on an f 4 pcb so that we can have it tested right away we start waiting for glc so you must stay tuned for part two part three rather of this tutorial where i'm going to etch this pcb and uh, and then have it tested for the purpose of detecting the presence of the mens and switching on our backup lighting okay 
thanks for watching please if you like this tutorial don't forget to subscribe to simtech channel and give it a thumbs up until next time stay tuned cheers Hey guys, welcome back to this tutorial on AC voltage main sensing sensor. Now, in the previous tutorial, part one and two, we went through the schematic, we designed the circuit, and then on part two, we did the PCB layout. Now, as you can see in front of us here, we've got the PCB layout that is completed. Now, before we continue, please consider subscribing to Simtech channel. This is part three of this tutorial. You've watched part one and part two. And if you found anything useful in this tutorial and also gives it a thumbs up, that will be highly appreciated. And on top of that, by subscribing to Simtech channel, you are guaranteed to continue to receive high quality tutorial of this nature and many more. Thank you so very much. Okay. Now, in order to manufacture this PCB, we have to complete a couple of things and one of each is to make arrangement of all your designator to ensure that everything is correct as you can see here rv1 is your top overlay that indicate this mov here and d3 is the same c2 here is indicating where the capacitor must be placed j1 the connector and f1 is your fuse and this is the same for the components that are placed on the bottom that you see that are inverted here. They are the component on the bottom, at the bottom. So what you have to do is to arrange them in a way that does not interfere. For instance, you can see here R2 that is placed on the, on the bottom layer, this one here. Now R2, the, the designator, the top over, the bottom overlay designator is sitting uh, right on top of the copper where the component should be soldered and if we go back to the 3d view and we just shift the board here you're gonna see that r2 here the designator is right there on the copper pad so which means you're not going to be able to see r2 when the board is printed so you have to fix that so if we go back on the 2d view so we have to grab r2 and then move it to an appropriate place. So let's just move it maybe somewhere there. Okay, so R2 is actually this one here and R3 is this one. So which means here you can actually move it somewhere here at the bottom. That's basically up to you where you want it. And this one here is R1 and this is fuse one which is standing at the bottom. This is D1 is exactly where we want it to be. And that's U2. Now this is another resistor R4. Okay. And D2. Then we've got R5. Then R6. So you must ensure that all your designators are correct. Q2 and the top one. Then once again, if you go on the 3D view, you can view it and you can see exactly. Okay, there is my F1. So we know that's a fuse. And that's J1. That's a MOV. Okay then this capacitor where is the designator for this capacitor so that's c1 so it's sitting there outside the board which is not the correct place for it to sit so we have to fix it but the rest of the things is correct j3 k1 j2 and d3 and c2 the capacitor is also correct so we just need to fix c1 let's bring it somewhere here so let's see there it is sitting there so let's just bring it and put it right there and see if that's going to be appropriate let's go back okay so that is c1 now how about we change rv1 and put it there somewhere like this or maybe even here rv1 okay just so that we avoid it interfering there we go so rv1 have been moved and c1 is there so this is how you do your component your top overlays for your designators and the bottom overlay and now the next thing to do is to generate your gerber so which means you have to go on your output job files okay go on the output job files and from here you have to generate the gerber's file okay and what you have to do is to come on the gerber's files after all your settings have been set you make sure that all your settings are set and you must select 
all the layers that you know where your 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 components and designators are placed make sure you select them right here and go through all the settings as you want them to be and then press ok now when you're done the next thing to do is just to click on generate content so you're going to generate content it's going to generate you all the gerbers file that you need for your project for your pcb and after generating the gerbers file all you have to do is to go to the folder where your project is located you're going to find a folder in the name of manuf and this is where all your gerbers file will be located so these are the file that you're going to attach in the zip file and send to whatever company or manufacturer that you want your pcb to be completed okay so this is just a brief description of what usually goes on with this thing okay but what we're going to do here is i'm going to do a further settings for etching this pcb so which means we're going to do a home made pcb etching so that we can test this quickly without waiting for a proper pcb to be manufactured now in order to do a pcb etching we'll have to do a few more settings so one of which will be to enable a selective gold top so that is another layer and the layer i've got a coating of green now the reason to do this is because the pcb material that we usually get they have negative photo resist coating so this is the reason why you put this layer so that you can change it into black and then change your pcb tracks these ones on the bottom layer into white so that means you basically inverting your pcb because if you don't do that it's automatically print into positive printing but you want to print a negative printing because your pcb material are of negative nature okay now to do that you go to files if you're using altium designer or any other pcb cage software the procedure is basically the same now first i'm going to go to select area then i'm going to select my pcb okay otherwise i will be selecting the entire sheet then i hit on refresh now we can see the pcb is here now we keep this on mono now the next thing is to go on pages now when you come on page here you know how to manage the layers where your components are now you know that your tracks okay your tracks as we have seen here they are on the bottom layers because some of your smt component or most of your smt component they're going to be on the bottom layer so your tracks are on the bottom layers but you have some of the component on the bottom layers then what you also have is you've got designators on the bottom overlay on top overlay but for the purpose of etching you're not going to select those for the purpose of etching all you need is only your tracks okay and to make sure that you can be able to drill also so that is your tracks and your multi layers so what we do here is we going to as you can see by default we've got all these layers already so let's go and manage layers okay then select all and select all okay now we've got no layers selected if i refresh as you can see there is nothing there now what i'm going to do is i'm first going to select the select gold top select gold top now if i select that now let's remove that mechanical data the select gold top okay if i refresh now i've got my select gold top that is there so this is basically this green area where my pcb is covered now what do i else need i need my tracks or let's first get a pcb outline now we know that the pcb outline is this fellow here okay that's a pcb this fellow here that's a pcb outline and that is this dotted line here as you can see the dotted line so what we have to do in order to show it we're going to move it whoa where is it now pcb outline come back here okay so let's go back to layers so we move the pcb outline on top of the selective gold top we move it on top okay and then we change the color to white and then you refresh as you can see now we've got the pcb outline now the next thing is to add another layers and you guessed it that will be the bottom layer where your tracks are 
because that's what you're going to etch where your tracks are and the holes. So once again, come back on layers. If you are using this version of Artium or any other CAD, this process is going to be similar. We move again the bottom layer on the top and then we're going to change it to white. And then once again, refresh. Now you can see your tracks are here, but something is missing. That is the point where you're going to be drilling, your drilling point, this one's here. And these are usually on your multi-layer. So you go back into manage layer and find the multi-layer. There it is, multi-layer. And then you come back here, move it again upward, and then you have to change the color to white again. White once again. And then you refresh. There you have it. So now you've got your multi layer now if you are going to etch now right now this pcb is good for etching you can print it on what you call it on scale of one to one or on the actual size that it says 50 4 percent 54 percent then you're going to print it on a tracing paper and you're going to pass it into your uv box now, please watch my tutorial on PCB etching where I explain in slightly great details how to do all these settings. So after you've done printing your PCB, then you'll be good to go. Now, there is something that we need to still add here because after you've printed here, after you etch this board, what you're going to notice is all this area on white, they are going to be your copper trace. They're basically going to be your tracks. But uh, if you don't have guides for drilling, you're going to have a problem. So you need to include something as a point of reference to enable you to print. Now, in order to do that, there is something we have to do. Now, what we're going to do is to take the selective gold top. Okay. Then we need to add a place, a pad. Okay. There it is, the pad. Then double click on the pad. Then you have to change this pad into selective gold bottom. Like that. And then you need to change it into one millimeter. Here it is. Now the reason we're doing this is so that we can, and as you can see, one millimeter is basically the size of the one millimeter drill bit that we're going to use. And then you copy it. And then what you have to do is basically to place it on the center there. So you're going to place it on all of them. We can also place them on the holes. Okay. Like that. And once you're done, you can shift S and then you can check where you've placed all your, your, your indicator. We can delay this. Now we can go back into the settings. Files, fabrication, composite drill. Now, what I found in this version of Altium, things just got reset here. But it's okay, we can just do it quickly again. We select the old PCB. We refresh. Okay, we are correct, correct, correct. And then we come on page. And then we say on edit layers. Okay, so what we can basically do here is uh, remove the PCB manufacturing assembly bottom, IPC courtyard, and all of these that we don't need. Even the top layer, we don't need. We need the bottom layer, okay? We need the bottom layer, selective gold bottom that we've just added. Those indicator must be right at the top, okay? Now, right now, if I refresh, as you can see, there's still nothing is happening here. But remember, we have to change these guys to white, the PCB outline, and the bottom layer. 
now i can refresh again as you can see something is happening there now there's something missing that is the multi-layer so i add my multi-layer correct and then i bring him up then i change him also to white then i refresh now you can see that my multi-layer is on point and you can see that the dot the black dot indicator are also there so this basically mean after we've etched this board they're not going to be any copper into the black area so which mean those will be our indicator for drilling so that we can drill correctly and properly so always try to do this when you are doing negative printing and uh, you come across the initial problem that i highlighted so basically what you have to do here is just to make sure you print it i already say on a tracing paper and you are good to go for etching once again stay tuned and also check my tutorial on pcb etching okay hey guys welcome back to this tutorial on men's voltage sensing now this is tutorial part four in part one we discussed the circuit we designed the circuit part two and three we did the pcb layout and we talked about the settings that you can do in order to generate the gerbers and also manufacture the pcb and also do the settings for etching now what you see in my hands here is the result of the etching so we've now etched the pcb as you can see right in front of you now i'm just going to go quickly into the components um i hope you've watched my tutorial on pcb etching because i explained how to do the etching process there i did not have time to record the etching process for this particular one but you will do uh some of the more etching in the upcoming tutorials now before we go any further please guys if you like this tutorial if you find anything useful don't forget to subscribe to my channel and give the tutorial a thumbs up that will be highly appreciated now what you see here is the pcb that we've done the layout okay so if you look at the the, the part two and part three we have a connector so this connector here is the input for the ac now this is the cap dropper board that we've designed now the input is going in through a fuse you can see this one here is an smt fuse now i've got the two resistor so now i've got two resistors the discharging resistors for the cap dropper this is the capacitor that we are using i'm not sure if you can read there this is a 224 nanofarad 400 volt capacitor now we already did a calculation for this capacitor we're getting a current range of around 16 milliamps now the input to the bridge rectifier as we can see here now on this board i do not have the mov connected on this board because this is just a test run we don't have to place the mov because we're not going to have a surge voltage as we're testing hopefully now the bridge is rectifying the voltage and is going into the capacitor now the two inputs here now the, the the two points here are where the capacitor is supposed to be connected as you can see here i do not have the capacitor so which means the circuit is working i've tested it already it's working but it's operating without the filtering capacitor so which means we're going to have a high ripple dc voltage on the input of the opto coupler here you can see this is the opto coupler and this one here is the 1k resistor on the input of the opto coupler and on the output of the opto coupler this is where we have our low voltage circuit and the circuit here is the one that is controlling the on and off of this relay here now I forgot to talk about the zener diode so the zener diode is connected on the other side that, that is on the top side of the board here we can just see the the pins of the zener so you can see that it's between the negative and the positive of the bridge rectifier okay so then as you can see from this point to this point there is no electrical connection there is no electrical connection whatsoever under the opto isolator here no connection between this side and this side that is exactly why the circuit is called an isolated circuit 
Now, I've already explained the working of the circuit when we were doing uh, the circuit design and uh, layout. That is on part 1, 2 and 3. But I'm just going to run quickly on the low voltage side here. So what will happen in the absence of the mains voltage, that means we don't have a voltage on the output of the bridge rectifier. So which means the opto isolator is not being biased, the LED the internal LED so what will happen then is this relay here have the the battery okay the 12 volt battery will be connected which is connected on the normally connected pole of the relay and that is passing power straight through this bulb here that will be running on a 12 volt battery so which means in the absence of the AC mains the normally connected is going to put on the bulb when the AC mains comes back, so we're going to have actions. So that means there will be a voltage that will be regulated from the uh, 5 volt Zener diode. And that 5 volt Zener will then bias the LED inside the opto isolator that we've talked about. And that in turn will set up a bias at the base of the transistor. And the transistor will then switch on, turning on this relay coil. So when the relay coil turns on, it switch the poles of the relay from the normally connected to normally open so which means it's cut off power from the bulb which is being powered from the 12 volt battery this one here okay that means this one will then be on this one will be on because why we've got the men's ac that is coming in from this input side okay and when men's ac goes out this bulb will go off and this one will come back on because the relay will switch back into the normally connected Okay, so this is how the circuit is supposed to operate. Now, I've already said that uh, there is no capacitor here. This is a capacitor that normally is supposed to be connected here that I did not place while assembling this uh, circuit. Nevertheless, the circuit is working. So it's just working with an unregulated voltage. So which means the 5 volt that we've got here, if I can probe it on the scope, will be... 5 volt unregulated because we're not putting a smoothing capacitor so if we have to connect the smoothing capacitor it will go on like this so we'll have this capacitor connected like this because we got a 5 volt zener diode so which means the capacitor could be anywhere from 16 volt higher that's up to you 220 microfarad no problem the, the circuit will still work so now let me just solder this capacitor here quickly and then we can test this circuit again with the capacitor connected okay so this is an electrolytic capacitor so which means while soldering this cap here you need to respect the polarity okay that means the longer legs because there is two pins here the longer one is a positive one now from my bridge rectifier here on the schematic we know that the capacitor is placed between the minus and the plus so this is the plus on the side so which means is gonna go from the top side of the board this way like that now I can just put it down there and solder it okay just press it flat on the board like that and then finish by soldering the other side okay if you are more than welcome to watch my tutorial on basics of soldering tubs and tricks then you can just cut these pins out because we don't need them okay so now we've got the capacitor that is now connected on the output of the bridge and that will be smoothing the voltage so now we can say that we've got a regulated 5 volt that is going into the opto couplers just to make the circuit more stable okay so now we can go ahead and start powering up our circuit and then to get it working okay so now we can go ahead and plug the battery okay so you will realize that you'll notice that when i connect the battery as soon as i connect the battery the bulb here which is running from the backup will come on as you can see it comes on okay now i'm going to test the voltage that is on the terminal of 
now on the input terminal of the battery you can see there it's 13.4 and if I test also on the output here it's exactly the same thing I just have my probe reverse there because it's a polarity voltage it's a battery okay so that gives me also 13.3 volt that is straight from this battery here okay so that is powering the backup now this multimeter here is connected from my input mains right now the input mains is off and again guys this is a dangerous experiment because i've got a mains voltage here and if you don't know how to handle the mains voltage please don't attempt this because if you shock yourself it's going to be a catastrophic problem you can you can seriously get injured okay so i'm going to switch on the ac mains automatically after switching on the ac mains this bar that is running on the backup is going to go off and that's exactly what happened and if you look at the multimeter here that is measuring the voltage on the input of my ac that is coming from this connector here these blue wires here that's my mains now i'm measuring a voltage of 232 that is 50 hertz 232 mains power mains voltage so what this means right now we don't have power outage so our backup light is off no power outage so we are running well there is no problem now if i go on and measure here on the dc output you can see i'm now measuring zero volt i'm now measuring zero volt on the dc output and obviously because the light is off now you realize that the ac mains bulb just went off and the the power is still 230 we don't have a power outage and the reason why is because this bulb here have an ambient light sensor inside so the room where i'm recording now has enough lighting so which means the ambient light is automatically going off but if i just toggle it mind you this one also comes on so my backup is still connected now if i bring it back now the, the bulb is back on so if it stays on again for another minute or so the ambient light will automatically turn it off because it's a ambient light sensor bulb now i just wanted to demonstrate by testing putting my probes onto the dc i'll put here okay be very careful if you're going to run this test because we've got mains here now when i switch off my mains you can see my voltage also is coming back here 13.3 volt as soon as the mains come back on this voltage goes to zero and this one come back to 230 and then we have mains on and then mains goes off this voltage here is zero there's no mains and this one come back on so this is how you can basically build a simple backup lighting now the only problem with, with this system here is you have to have both installation running in parallel so basically you have your mains mains lighting installation and you also have your backup lighting installation so which means this bulb here that's running on 230 will not run on the 12 volt but if you make a mistake of taking this 12 12 volt run bulb you put it on a 230 then you're gonna see the magic smoke so you have to distinguish that but there are circuit that you can implement so that you can use only one bulb for the two system but that will be a very smart circuit so this is not a topic for that subject okay so that is it guys if you like this tutorial you find anything useful about it please subscribe to simtech channel and give a tutorial a thumbs up drop a comment on the comment section ask a question and i will attend to it as soon as possible thank you for watching until next time cheers